Come on in, make yourself at home. Shelter here on this lovely Sunday afternoon evening. So I just come back from a, a church of Filipinos. We had a wonderful time ministering there, and the power of God came and touched the people, encouraged them, and uh, gave them life and hope and focus on a future. And so we're making an impact tomorrow. We're heading out to Cambodia. Valerie, myself, we're going in and I was just explaining our objectives. Uh, one is to do a worship conference that I'm doing, and that sounds really big. It's a smaller group of worship leaders within a couple of different ministries, and I'm going to go and teach them some things, and we're also going in to check on a house that we acquired the last time that we went in and make sure everything's okay there, maybe buy some chairs for it and things like that while I'm in. And also, Miss Valerie's going to go and to start making plans for our church involvement with child outreach and helps in the ministries there that are already in operation, but also find what's the best way, her mission is going to be to find out exactly how can we be the biggest blessing possible in Nam Thang, Cambodia. So from that, we will begin to make more plans of group trips so that we can all get involved and go in. How many of you want to go to Nam Thang, Cambodia? Door. It's a very close flight. Some are very inexpensive sometimes to go in, so this is going to be great. Pray for us that we have success on our trip. We're only there for a few days. I'll be back here this Wednesday, so the regular service is on for Wednesday. And so we're excited. Amen. Let's just honor the Lord in this place right here, right now. Invite Him to have His way, to do whatever He wants to do, and then we're going to worship Him and message out of Genesis to share with you later, and already I feel his presence in this room with us, and so let's just take the moment to tell him that we honor him, why don't you stand at your feet with me as we pray, as we worship, I love you.
invite you in this room, Lord, to have your way in us. Whatever you want to do, Lord, we yield to you. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. Let the power of your Spirit move through this place. Let your anointing, Lord, break the yoke of everything that holds us, everything that holds us back, that doesn't allow us to be free. Let your Spirit, Lord, bring freedom to us. Let your Spirit minister life to us. We yield to you, Jesus. We yield to you, Jesus. Jesus.
this house. The Lord's presence is in this place. Right now. Right here. Whatever your needs are. Whatever you want from the Holy One. He's here. The sweet presence of Jesus. The very fragrance of heaven. In this place, man. somebody is fearing an early onset arthritic condition in their life. Somebody is fearing that there, there may be arthritis because it's been in your family and, and your family members have suffered from it and, and a couple times you've felt some aches and some pains in areas of your body and you've thought, oh, I guess, I guess it's now my turn. I see, as I hear those words, I see a dark shadow whispering those ideas in your ear. And the shadow is not of God, and the shadow is not the Lord. The shadow is demonic. It's a lie from, from hell. It's a lie. The Lord does not want you to get under a curse. The Lord does not want you to decide and accept the lie. It does not matter what your family has. It does not matter what has happened in your family or in your aunts or uncles or mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers. None of that is relevant when we deal with an awesome and a powerful God in the covenant of healing that he offers us through the blood of Jesus. And if you dare accept that, if you dare accept that, his healing virtue can run through you right now, right here, and that arthritis and the fear of it can vanish. It can vanish. You don't have to be old to get under these kind of fears. You don't have to be an old person and well advanced in years to, to be under these kind of ideas. The devil comes to us as young people. I mean, he feeds us statistics and ideas. And, you know, because this is in your family and this happens, don't get under those lies. I refuse to accept the legacy of sin. I refuse to accept the curses of sin over my family's past. 
because the blood of Jesus has purchased for me divine standing. The blood of Jesus has bought for me divine healing. And nor I nor my children have to suffer with anything that the devil would say. This is what is coming to you and this is what is your inheritance. We reject the lie. We reject the curses that are trying to put on us and we make a choice today to believe Jesus. Come on, believe Jesus. Believe in the blood. Believe in the cross. Believe in the stripes that were laid on his back. Believe in the suffering and the anguish and the pain that he endured so that you would never have to. And be healed this night. Be healed this night. Our God is a healer. Our God is a healer. Our God is a healer. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the God of healing. He is the God that heals you of all sickness and disease. Oh, I feel the healing virtue of God flowing like electricity in this place. I'm telling you, I feel healing. Recognizing the 
presence of Jesus that the healing comes. It's upon seeing in your spiritual eyes and in the depths of your heart, you see the very face of Jesus and know that his hand of healing extends to you. He even asks you a question tonight. He said, would you be healed? He says, would you be healed? Because yes, he has to ask yes. because often we, we don't even know if we want to be healed. We have so many ideas and we've listened to lies for so long. But now that those lies are cleared up and you know tonight, and I'm telling you the gospel and the good news is that you are not subject to the past. You're not subject yes. to the hereditary yes. bloodlines. Yes. Yes. So whatever you want from him, you receive him from him. No matter what passes physically from your parents, you don't have to receive it. You don't have to receive it. And he says, would you be healed? Would you be healed? And we say, Father, heal us. We say, Jesus, say the word and we will be healed. Just say the word. Oh, Jesus, that's my petition right now. Jesus, say the word. Jesus, say the word. Jesus, speak on us. Speak over us. Speak healing. Speak healing, Lord. Speak deliverance. Speak deliverance over us. Bring balance into our minds and our lives. Or let this be the year of healing for us. Let this be the year of divine health. Not just divine healing, but divine health. Let this be the year that we look at and say, you know what? I didn't get sick not even once the whole year. Lord, let it be a year of the covenant of healing for us. Let us enjoy all the benefits yes, Lord. of what the blood of Jesus has yes, done for us. Yes, Lord. Healing. Yes. We're grateful for it, Lord. Yes. Grateful for the covenant that you make with us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. to the meeting that's shelter tonight. It's a blessing to be together in God's presence. I was praying today for a group of people, about 50, 50 or 60 people lined up for me to lay hands on them concerning crossing into the new and leaving the old behind. And uh, there was a woman there who was just in the group, I prayed one by one and went through. And this particular woman, she, she was just like anyone else. I prayed for her and then I walked past. And as I was walking away, the Lord says, no, pray for her again. And I went back and that's what we dealt with. We dealt with healing 
and things in her life. And I just began to speak what the Lord was telling me about her as an individual. And I knew that I was on target because of the pastor's wife looking and like, wow, wow, wow. You know, when, when the Lord is speaking, it's obvious. And um, as I was praying for her and speaking against those things, she kept looking back at the pastor's wife like, look. God knows. It's a beautiful thing when you realize that God is aware of your situation. He's got it under control. And I spoke life to her today. You know, that's our job. There are enough people speaking death out there. Everybody you talk to is speaking death. It's the end. It's the end. And everything's falling apart. And the economy's bad. And we're in a recession. And, and you know, there's pollution. And the global warming. And the whole world is going to turn into a big boiling pot. And, and everything's bad, bad, bad. No, we serve a God that is good, good, good. We just need to connect to Him and keep our focus on Him. That's what we do every day. My wife and I join together and we go into that presence in and, and once again, when we meet with him, once we get through, because we also wake up with the bad, bad, bad feelings, and the, oh no, another day. But once we break through the barrier, the membrane of worry, and burst that and get into the bubble of God, the bubble of God's presence, in that place, suddenly everything is okay. And you meet with God, and he's puzzled why you were so worried, and you're puzzled why you were so worried. You don't understand why. I know I was perplexed about something a little while ago, Lord, but it just doesn't seem to be relevant any longer. And that's the beautiful thing about the presence of the Lord is that we can go in and just rest. Just rest in, in, the, in His glorious presence and receive from Him the blessings that He has for us, the treasures that He has lined up for us. And those things are things like healing. And there's so many promises in His Word that He's given. There's so many things that He's offering us and... and one of the reasons why I'm really exhorting everyone to read the whole Bible with me this year, whole Bible in 2012, I set up a separate page on Facebook specifically for that. And if you want to get to it, you can go to movewithcompassion.com and the link right there, you see a picture of a Bible, click it, it'll take you right to, and that is a public site, so whether you're my friend or not, you can access that. And there are all the files of the daily Bible reading. And one of the reasons why I want that is because I want everyone to be aware of the promises. And we do not accept or place a demand on things that we are ignorant of. And if we're ignorant of the promises of God, we don't say, I believe for this or I believe for that because we don't even know that it's available. I could set up a delicious buffet right behind your house and have, you know, kill the fatted calf and have delicious food from many nations and fried chicken and fried fish and fish fillets and, and sauteed grouper and snapper and all these delicious things and pastas and treats and, you know, five flavors of soft ice cream serving and flowing at, at whatever you require and all you can eat. And if you don't know about it, it's worthless to you, no matter how much trouble I go through. And that's exactly what God has provided for us, a buffet. He's provided so many wonderful treasures and blessings for us. And if we don't know that it's there, then we won't avail ourselves of what God is trying to give us. And that's where his word comes in. Because he, he has things for us, and he's promised us things, but his promise is his word. His word is his promise, and his word is his bond with us or the covenant with us. Why it's called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant because they are covenants, agreements that he has ratified in the blood of Jesus Christ for us and all the benefits. It's been won completely by the one for you and it's all available and he's saying come and take freely. Then if you don't know about the details of the covenant, the New Covenant, it's all written there and the Old Covenant gives you the perfect stage that it sets as a type and a shadow for you to learn the principles of the new covenant. If you don't know that, then you won't receive those things. And that's why we need God's word. And I recommend that you go with me. Please listen to the word. I want to read it to you every day. And I'll do that. And how many of you have heard the files and you're listening to the Bible online? Good. Good. That's excellent. I want you to do that. And I want you to get other people involved too. Send it, post people, tag people on there, you know, tag, tag everybody. And, you know, that really irritates me when people do that to me, but do it to them. <laughs> so they can suddenly on their profile, the Bible shows up. You know, that, it's a way that you can preach. The, you're preaching the gospel by doing it because you're putting the promise out there. 
And, and this promise that he's offered us is, it's not a new promise. It's been around for a long time. He's been promising men things for a long time. And what I want to talk about tonight is the promise oriented life. Because you can orient your life on a lie and on fear. You can base your belief system on what the world dictates to you, or you can base it on the promise that God gives us. And the promise oriented life is a successful life. No matter what happens, no matter what difficulties arise, you will end up blessed because he has promised you and he's not a man that he would lie. He's not lying to you. He's telling the truth. And his word is truth. And his word sets us free. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. His word is truth. But we need to go to it. We need to accept it and, and learn it. And I know we're doing that. And we need other people to do that too. We need people to learn the scriptures, and, and this is an exciting time. Our lives are built upon the foundation of a covenant with God. A covenant with God is a promise depending on our ability to believe our faith. In other words, we have this promise from God, and that is the covenant, but it is faith activated. And it cannot and will not be ratified or enacted and manifested in your life without faith because without faith it's impossible to please God. I'm not teaching on faith tonight, but you know. Our lives must be oriented by the compass of this promise to us. And then if we find that the word can be the center of our life, it's like that compass. If we will always know the right direction. We'll always know north, south, east, and west and which way to go if we go to the compass. And the compass is the promise, is the covenant, is the word. And we need that desperately in our lives. We need to live the promise-oriented life. And God looks for people to use in his kingdom. And he desires to bless everybody. It is his plan, by the way, to do good to all people. He knows the plans that he has for us. Promises to prosper us and give us a hope, not to hurt us it says in Jeremiah, but to bless us. He wants to do that. And that's not just for some unique individuals. That's for every single person who calls on the name of the Lord. And it's for every person who's not yet called on the name of the Lord because he wants them to. And so it is available to all. And the road to these blessings is visible throughout the stories of the Bible in the lives of the patriarchs. All of the Bible characters that we're reading about as we go through, and I love reading the Bible, and I'm having a lot of fun this year because I'm double reading. I have to read it to record it and then read it separately to my wife. And so I'm getting, I'm reading the Bible two times this year, which is really cool. And, and it's going back into me. You know, sometimes I read it three times because my wife may wake up a little later than I am. And so if I'm down there already, I read through it. When she comes down, I lie to her. She'll say, did you read the Bible? I said, no, not yet. Even though I already read it, I said, no, no, I'll read it. I mean, because I, I want to read it again. And that way I get to read it out loud. And, and the more, the better. You cannot overdo the word of God. If you walked around constantly with a Bible in your face, 24 hours a day, and that's all, and you fell asleep with the Bible on your face, that's not overdoing it. You cannot possibly have too much word in your life. It's not possible. And I, I challenge you, I dare you to try to push it to its extremes. Try to have too much word in your life as an experiment and guess what's going to happen. You're going to be so blessed that you're going to realize that why haven't I done this before? Why didn't I stay in the word? Why? Because your flesh doesn't like the word and because the devil doesn't like the word and this world hates the word and everything vies for your attention to get you out of it and that's why I'm making it as easy as possible. I know I'm like a symbol. Kang, kang, kang. I'm making it as easy as possible for you to just click a button and hear me say Genesis chapter 17 and read it to you so that we can make it easy. Because there's a road we see in these stories and it's a beautiful unfolding of God's blessing. And Abraham's life stands as a graphic example of this process of belief and trust leading to ultimate blessings and God's best for our lives. I can use run-on sentences if I want to because I write it so I can do that. But when I read it, it doesn't sound like a run-on sentence, does it? It sounds like it was actually, but anyway. Don't judge my grammar. We will look at the relationship between God and Abraham in chapters 17 and 18 of Genesis to see what? Seven elements of the promise-oriented life. And that's our message tonight. These seven elements we're going to see. And we're going to start with number one. God appears to us. 
The first element of a promise-oriented life is the appearing of the Lord. And this is what we see with Abram. Now, we start the story in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, but this is not the first time the Lord appears to Abram. He appeared to him again and again, but relative to what we're sharing, we want to see this. And it says in verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. I'd be, in, you know, he just like showed up and said, hey, I'm God Almighty. Introduced himself, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. And when he said numbers, basically he meant apply it to anything you want. Your numbers of people, your numbers of coins, your numbers of cash, your numbers of cattle, your numbers of houses and lands, and almost your numbers of wives. You know, he had numbers of a lot of things. We won't apply that today. Amen. My wife is looking at me. We see that the verse in another translation says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the almighty God. Walk and live habitually before me and be perfect, blameless, wholehearted, and complete. That's from the Amplified. I like the, the um, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is one that I also read daily. I read that daily, and I read the NIV daily. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him, saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. I like that. Live in my presence presence. The Lord appeared to him and said, see the appearance of God in our lives is the beginning of our promise oriented life. This is the orientation meeting that shifts us out of a self-determined existence into a life lived according to our faith in what he says to us. And he speaks to us he tells us something, we receive the information and we have a choice to believe. A moment ago, by the Spirit of the Lord, I was speaking about healing and about how you don't know. Now, you have a choice to believe what God has spoken here tonight. And you can say, well, no, I, don't. I happen to know that the doctors have studied for many years and because of their vast knowledge and because of their extensive education and all that they know, I'm going to go ahead and choose to believe them. Well, fine then, see, be it according to your faith then you will indeed have all the sicknesses and diseases that you want. You can order all that you want. They're free for you. Go ahead, right out and get all the sickness and all the maladies and everything that you want. You can have it by faith. And that's by faith. You're ex exercising your faith. You know, like when people say there's a cold going around, I'm going to get a cold. Well, what is that? That's faith. You have faith. It's the, you don't have it yet, but it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I don't have a cold yet, but I probably will. So I'm guessing, yeah, I'm going to get a cold. Everybody gets a cold. So what are you doing? You're having an exercising faith that you will have a cold. The flu is going around. It's flu season. I mean, if you want, if you invite sickness to your house, I heard an evangelist say this one, it will come into your house and sit down and have tea with you. It will be happy to spend time with you. Sickness looks for people to be with. And, and you know, people who, there are people who celebrate sickness and disease. There are people who enjoy it. God bless the elderly, but sometimes they just love their sicknesses and their diseases. They, they, call, they take possession of it. If you hear the way they speak it, they call it my arthritis. I take this for my arthritis. I take this for my diabetes. You know, that's not just any words that mean something. That means they've taken possession. They claim it and own it for themselves because of this backwards faith system. And, and the Lord doesn't want that. But God appears to us and we have an orientation meeting with him, which is the manifestation of his presence. When you know all of a sudden and you are sure God is standing with you, it might be in a church service, it might be in your private prayer room, but suddenly you're aware that God is with you. That is this first step. And the Lord comes and he speaks to you and he gives you a promise. He says, live in my presence and be devout. Abram was invited to live his life in the presence of God. Then when God makes himself known to us, he gives us an invitation to live in his presence and make choices accordingly. I like the way it says it there. He says, live in my presence. Live before me, it says in one translation, but it means where I am. 
And when we make a choice on a daily basis to live in the presence of the God, that's his appearing in our life. And that is the beginning of the promise oriented life. You decide because he's the promise giver. If you stay close to him, he will give you the promise and he will keep the promise to you. But if you wander away from the source of life and the blesser, then you will tend to get off on some offshoot road that's going to lead you into something that will be detrimental to you. But that's why he said he invited him to live in his presence. He invites us all to live in his presence. And if there's one thing I definitely preach and teach in this church is that you live in the presence of the Lord, that you seek that on a daily basis. Let's go to number two. God changes our identity. In Genesis 17, Abram fell face down. Well, he did because God just said, hey, I'm God Almighty. Basically, he walked in on him. He appeared and says, I'm God Almighty, and I've come to do a deal with you and give you a covenant. I'm going to bless you and multiply you. And Abraham fell face down. That was his response. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Number two is God changes our identity. Abraham, when he fell face down, this is the proper response to the presence of the Lord. We must respect the presence of God and honor him by making him the center of our life. No longer will you be called Abram. Now, as a result of him coming into the presence of God, God changing his identity. He's changing his name from Abram to Abraham. And I did a lot of studying about exactly what that means. My favorite description of this is very simply the H in the name Jehovah was taken and put into Yahweh, put his letter inside the name of Abram, because without the H, the, the, it shows up in English writing as an H and an A together. But take that out and you have Abram. But he put the H, it's the same letter as Jehovah. He took a piece of God and put it inside of Abraham, his spirit, his presence, and he became Abraham. God changed the identity of Abram. He renamed him. And God does this to everyone who truly decides to live life based upon the promises of God. When you make that choice, it pleases the Lord. And the Lord responds by changing the way you are. One of the things that changes is the way people think about you because now they will name you differently. When they talk about you now, they say the, the one that talks about all that God stuff. The one that's always talking about Jesus. I don't want to be around them any longer because all they ever want to talk about is God. And so connected with you, sometimes behind your back, you don't even know the names that they're calling you, but they're calling you the fanatic or whatever. They put that name on you, that fanatical person. And, you know, if your name is Harry, they might call you Hallelujah Harry. Well, don't go around Hallelujah Harry because he's going to talk. Well, that's good. That's, a, that's, a, that's what you want. You want that kind of reputation. That's good for you because the people who are negative concerning the promises of God will not want to be around you, so you won't even have to make the choices to not be around such people. They'll make the choice for you. And all you have to do is live a, a promise-oriented life, which means you are reciting and speaking, and your very identity is transformed as a result. Number three. God gives us things. You know, this keeps coming up in my spirit for this year, 2012, about God's going to give us things. And already I have seen, I'm watching things show up. I had somebody give me eight chocolate bars. Eight chocolate bars. I tried not to take them. No, have more. Have another. No, have this. No, this is enough. No, take this too. And you need this one. You need, they give me eight Whitaker chocolate bars, you know, the, the expensive, thick, not wonderful chocolate. And it seems like a small thing to you, but you, don't, you need to understand, I love chocolate. <laughs> That's the blessings of God. 
if I had went and bought those chocolate bars, eight chocolate bars of that quality, like $4 a bar, $5 a bar, if you bought those, they're very expensive for those little bars. Do the math. That's a lot of, so I got blessed. I had someone give me a, a, a mixing console. I had someone give me a high quality microphone for recording. As soon as I said I wanted to record the Bible, they gave me a studio quality recording microphone. And they gave me studio speakers. Worth stuff worth thousands of dollars in one evening. Somebody, because I said, this all, by the way, this all happened as we come into the new year. God is just pouring stuff out on me. How many of you want to get in on that action? I believe that this is God's provision for all of us that are coming together in this group as we meet together. Whether you're part of this church or not, you get under this blessing, and part of it is God gives us things. God wants to bless us. We're reading about Jacob. Jacob planted a field, and the first time he planted, his first harvest was a hundredfold. That's amazing. Amazing. That'd be like if you invest a dollar, you get a hundred dollars back on your return. That's a pretty good investment. If I could offer you some type of a banking scheme, you give me a hundred dollars, and I'll give you one hundred um, or ten thousand dollars, a hundred times the amount that you give me. Give me five dollars, and I'll give you five hundred dollars. How many of you would take that deal? Of course you would. Well, that's a God deal, and that's what the Lord wants for us. God gives us things. Genesis seventeen eight says, "The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, you don't even belong here right now. You're a stranger in a foreign land." But guess what? I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. This whole land. Basically, he told him, and his proper response is to bow down and honor the Lord and begin to talk to him. He changed his identity, changed his name, and then said to him, look, look around. You see this place? You like this land? I guess, yeah, this is a great place. Well, you know what? I'm going to give it to you. And it didn't even belong to him, so to speak. Of course, God owns all things. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the Bible says. But he said, I'm going to give it all to you. And this is what God wants to do. He wants to bless us. I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. God tells Abraham that he will give him the land. He had to accept the fact that God wanted to give him something great. And this is a problem with a lot of Christians. They don't want to accept the blessings of the Lord because they have a culture and a mindset that tells them, no, we only want just a little bit just enough to make it, and they limit, and God is trying to bless people sometimes, but they limit what God can do. I am not going to limit the Lord. I say, God, whatever you want to give me, I'll take it. And give me, I told the Lord the other day, I was looking at the, the clover over there and some of these condominiums, and I thought, you know, I'd like a condominium. Give me a condominium. I want a condominium, and I wish I could tell you right now, and he did. Not yet, but I'll tell you when it happens. I, have, I was with a group of pastors, this is a true story, I was in India, and we were trying to get out to the villages, and we had trouble, we'd have to take a bus if we wanted to go, or hire a vehicle, so I wanted to get my own Mahindra Bolero, which is a, a truck in India, and uh, we were in a shopping mall, and I was with a few pastors, and there was a golden colored Mahindra Bolero, a brand new showpiece in the middle of the shopping mall, and we went over to it, and, and the pastors were with me and I said, no, I, I want this. I want this very vehicle, this color, exactly like this. And I put my hands on it and the pastors looked at me like, what are you doing? And I said, Father, I want one of these. We could really use this for the work here in India and I pray for it in Jesus' name. And the pastors laughed. They're like, ha, 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 that's funny. They laughed until I pulled up in a brand new golden Mahindra Bolero in front of the pastor's house. They were not laughing anymore. Like, what are you doing with that? I said to the Lord, you know how it happened? I went back to the U.S. The Lord spoke to somebody, invited me to lunch, and said, the Lord told me to give you something. I already had the price for the vehicle and what I needed. The man handed me a check for exactly the amount of the vehicle. He did not know about the vehicle or the price or how much it was. He just knew what the Lord told him. He gave me one check that paid for the entire vehicle. I took that check, went back to India, bought the vehicle, and drove it right to those pastures. Hi. <laughs> and you know they were jealous and even angry at me? They were angry and criticized me. I had more trouble because of that. And you know what? Blessings will cause you trouble. 
But don't, don't be ashamed of the blessings of the Lord. That's just the vehicle. He's offering Abraham the whole nation. All of this, you can have it. I did say, Lord, Lord, I'll take one of those condominiums if you want to give me one. I would like that. But also, please, if you do that, I want to, I want to like a $100,000 gift certificate for courts and for Ikea. Because I would like to be able to put in it what I want to put in. You know, the right things. If you can do it, do it right. Make sure you tap your arrows more than just a couple of times. If you know that story, when you ask the Lord for something, ask entirely. Be specific with the Lord because the Lord does want to bless you. As we live our, life, our, our lives, it should say, based upon the promises, we have to believe them for them to become reality. You have to believe this way. God wants to give you many things, but you have to live the promise-oriented life like Abraham. Abraham doubted it, he wrestled with it, but ultimately he believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. And God blessed him and prospered him. And he grew so rich so fast that he and his nephew couldn't even live in the same place because they had so many. When it came time for his nephew after parting from him to have to be rescued, he had 318 militarily trained servants that were born in his house. That's rich. That's rich. When you have 318 people, they're born in your house. And now they're adults trained from, for war. And you take them and conquer multiple nations and kings and take back everything. How many can see the blessings of God on someone like that? That's because God's not playing a game and he's not playing a game with us. He really does want us blessed. So here we go to number four. God requires a distinction to be made. Now, I want to explain this, and uh, this may get a little graphic. I'll try to be as sensitive as possible when I cover this, but we're going to use it as a metaphor. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep, every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant is in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now there's a lot here, more than what meets the eye, but we see that it will be the sign in the next frame. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you, he said. A sign. Abraham and his people had to bear this distinguishing mark between themselves and the people around them to prove that they were people oriented by the promise. In other words, the orientation upon the promise of God caused them to have to undergo a physical change and this distinction was a painful process. I would not want to be someone, I, I, I imagine, imagine the day that Abram then turned to all the people in his house after this encounter with God and come, guess what guys, I got great news. Yeah, what? Tell us Abram. Well, the first they call him Abram. Tell us Abram. Oh, first of all, my name is now Abraham. <laughs> call me Abraham. Okay, Abraham. And I'm sure they slipped up a couple times and said, hey, Abram, I mean, Abraham. And he said, look, God came to me. Oh, that's awesome. What did he tell you? Oh, he said he's going to bless us. Hallelujah. He said he's going to give us all this land. Hallelujah. He's going to multiply us and prosper. Hallelujah. And we're going to circumcise ourselves. <laughs> what was that again? Imagine looks on their faces when he said, yes, we're going to take a knife and then we're going to cut and we're going to. No, no make you not want the blessings. But we see this as a type and a shadow, remember. We're not in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. But these are examples. And I have found that there has to be something to distinguish us. We must be visibly different from the world around us. God requires that we be different. This circumcision is a figure of what we live as a chaste and separate life of promise. 
Romans 2, 28, 29, Paul spoke of if a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart by the spirit, not the letter. That man's praise is not from men, but from God. In the New Testament, we saw this principle of circumcision brought over to a spiritual interior change. The, the circumcision of the heart means that your heart is not the same as everybody else's heart, just like their male genitalia was no longer the same as all the other people in the nation. If you wanted to see someone who was oriented to the promise and that they, all you had to do is lift up their skirt. Oh, you're a promise guy. They would know from looking. Of course, we wouldn't do that. It would be kind of vulgar. But the fact is they had a physical change in their physical body to prove this. We carry that in our heart. Our hearts are different than the hearts of the people in the world. Our hearts work different. At least they're supposed to if we are indeed carrying this mark. There has to be a visible difference. The choices we make, the things we believe. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. I focus on those words because this distinction is for you and everyone you associate with on a familiar basis. It was so important that God did not allow them to dwell in the same habitation with people who were not circumcised. From now on, those people, will, they will be cut off. You don't want them. In other words, be careful with your alliances and your friendships and the people. If those people are not circumcised in the heart, if they don't have a covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ, then they make odd bedfellows for us. And it becomes difficult. What fellowship does light have with darkness? And we try sometimes to build and keep relationships, but God is telling us, even in this, this type and shadow we see in the scripture, that is, we need to make a distinction. And if you're a person of promise and you're vocal about it and you're oriented to the promise, as I said, that alone will distinguish you so much because they will see the circumcision of the heart through the words that you speak and they will make choices to not hang around the fanatic, the one that talks about the Lord all the time, until they need help and they get to the point where they need change. Then they'll seek you out. I've been a Christian long enough to see this happen. I've seen many people who made fun and laughed and mocked, but now they know they can trust me, they can depend upon me, they can contact me for spiritual help. The promise-oriented life can only be achieved when you surround yourself with people living the promise-oriented life. And, you know, outside of forming some cultish compound where we lock our way ourselves away which I've been tempted to do through the years honestly I have really always and I would love to have a farm somewhere and and just just live the Christians out there but that's really not what God intended we're put on this earth as salt and light both of which if you get in your eyes it burns we are supposed to burn the eyes of the world if I throw salt in your eyes ow if I shine light in your eyes, it's bright. We don't hide the light. We put it there. He leaves us amongst the tares or the weeds as wheat. He leaves the sheep and the goats mixed together so that we can be an influence and make a change, but yet we still remain distinctly different because we live a promise-oriented life. He has broken my covenant is what he says about it. We share this orientation and everything we discuss and do revolves around the promise of God. If we allow the influence of people not living by his promise, we will weaken our own resolve to continue in faith. And I've seen it happen through the years. Christians who are on fire for Jesus and excited, but they make a new friend somewhere and, and they start spending a little, little bit more time with that person and a little bit more and a little bit more and they start getting comfortable again because because they, they don't have to be so Christian with that person. And before you know it, they're not coming to the services. They're not in the church. And then all of a sudden, you see them coming out and confessing that they are something sinful or that they don't really believe or they're an atheist. I've seen people go apostate entirely from having been a, an on-fire Christian. We just posted some pictures. Um, um, how many of you believe that me and my wife are better looking today than we were? <laughs> those years ago. If you look at those pictures, I mean, I, I look basically like I was, it looks like a guy that ate me because I'm, I'm like a lot bigger. 
But that guy in those pictures, you know, that, but we graduated and in that graduate, we were looking at that big graduating class. You see all those people with the caps and the gowns. Those were the people in our class. And, and I, we couldn't find anyone that was still in full-time ministry. There's only like one other. Did we, how many did we find in the whole group? One, one other person. And even, yeah, that, no, that, they are full-time. But there's only one other person. So it's me and Barbara and one other guy, and I can single that person out in the picture and show you all the rest are, are gone. Gives you something to think about. But the difference is that we have made a choice, come hell or high water, we have chosen to orient our lives on the promise of God no matter what. And so we have stood the test of time and we stand here. We're not going anywhere. That's why I tell you, if I'm going to pastor this church, I'm pastoring this church. You're going to have to shoot me to get me to stop. Because once I make a covenant and an agreement with a group of people, I will stay there and I will be faithful to do that. I said the worst case is I get thrown out of the nation and then it's simple. You just need to go to church in Jehovah. <laughs> It'd be that simple. It's no big deal. We could work it out. Just cross over. the. I would make it as easy as possible for you. Believe me, I'm still going to be here for you no matter what happens because I'm a person of promise. And see, that infects you. You believe the promise and he keeps his word to you at all times. And so that reflects through you and you start keeping your word. You become one that people can trust with a promise. Number five, God changes people around us to bless us. And this comes down to his wife. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. There's the H again. Adding the same H from his name to the name of Sarai to make it Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Now here, it says, as for Sarah, your wife, you're no longer to call her Sarah. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her. You see, Sarah was blessed by her association with a man living the promise-oriented life. In fact, she didn't really believe it. She's the one giggling in the tent when the angels come and said, by this time next year, your wife will conceive. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Abraham believed, and it was counted him as righteous. She didn't even believe but she still got blessed because she was in association with a person. Therefore, the people that surround you, the ones who don't choose to walk away from you, but actually tolerate you, they, whether they realize it or not, they're going to get saved and healed and delivered and set free. They will come around to stay faithful and continue to believe the Lord, live your life based on the promises of God and keep smiling, keep going, and they will be changed by God as a result. When we live our lives according to God's promises and insist on doing so, the people around us will be changed by our influence and their acceptance of us will be seen by God and he will transform them in time. I've seen it happen. Number six, coming to the end of the message, we have seven points in total. God expects us to believe the impossible. You hear me say this a lot, but as you see it throughout the scriptures, these patterns, in fact, this sevenfold pattern I found here, you can actually find it in the life of Joseph and in the life of several of the patriarchs, the same pattern. But here, he expects us to believe the impossible. Abraham fell face down again. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing, because he already had Ishmael. The boy was alive and running around, and Sarah was still not getting pregnant. So look, at least we have the child of Hagar. Can't we just use, come on, just use this guy. He already tried pushing off his, his manservant before, Eliezer, when he tried to get him and said, look, why can't you just use this guy? No, it will not be the servant. It will be someone from your own house. So now he's Ishmael. No, it's going to be the child because there's a way that God does things because it is possible and easy for Ishmael to be the one. Abraham jumped to that conclusion and we do that. We look at what's possible and that's our choice. Well, we can do this because this is what's right here. That doesn't mean it's the Lord because God has a reputation to uphold as a miracle worker. And so he's not going to do things that you can possibly take credit for. 
But God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. And on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his house. This is that bad news that he had to break to Ishmael and the others. Hey guys, guess what? Ishmael at least was 13. Some of those guys were old. Abraham was 99 years old. It could have been actually a better thing. He never, maybe he didn't have as much feeling and so it was easier for him to endure. Look at the next frame. Abraham fell face down. The next one. Thank you. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And God said, yes, about Ishmael, but your wife Sarah will bear your son. Because that's what's impossible. The promise-oriented life is based upon promises of the impossible. God tells you he will do something that is outrageous. It is not even possible. You choose to believe this and he sees it as your righteousness and justifies you supernaturally. Not in a natural way, but supernaturally he does this. And that brings us to number seven, the last one. God fulfills his promises to us. In Genesis 18, and we're going to read parts of these verses, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mammon while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get, some, uh, get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they said, and they answered him, do as you say. So Abraham heard in the tent, said, Sarah, he said, quick, he said, get three seals of fine flour, make them some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a, a tender calf from, from amongst those. He brought it to a servant. He had the servant prepared. He brought some curds and milk and, and the calf that had been prepared, and he put it before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. He was just watching them eat and be blessed. And they said, where's your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said, now you can go. Thank you. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. There's the promise again. She's going to have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Obviously, she had already went through menopause and was no longer even able to bear children. So Sarah laughed to herself because, you know, it's impossible for a woman who's already past the age of childbearing to have a child. Once they've been in through menopause, they, they can't have a child. So Sarah laughed to herself. She thought, after I'm worn out, my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And that's a question for you concerning the promises of God. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You answer the question. Answer it. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, of course not. I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> but he said, yes, you did laugh. Imagine how embarrassing that was at that moment. I, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did laugh. See, I'm, I know the difference. Now, I want you to look at Genesis chapter 21, and this is the fulfillment. The Lord came to Sarah as he had said. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham. As it says down in verse 6, God has made me laugh, and everyone who hears me will laugh with me. Who would have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne a son for him in his old age. The Lord came to Sarah, as he had said, and she became pregnant. And God always keeps his promises. He's not a man that lies. 
When we choose to live the promise-oriented life, we will see miracles. And he wants to do miracles for you. We saw these seven things. Before we pray, let's recap. God appears to us. God changes our identity. Number three, God gives us things. Number four, God requires a distinction to be made between us and the rest of the people. God changes people around us. God expects us to believe the impossible and then he fulfills his promise to us. And I conclude with Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. The promise-oriented life. See, when you put your life on the foundation of God's promises and you decide that, Lord, I am not going to believe the lie. You don't have to live according to the limitations of what you call possible. You understand that he's, he's wanting us to live a supernatural life. And, and only some of you are just starting to really understand and see supernatural things and know, wow, God can do things that are not possible. And they're not supposed to happen, but they happen. Nobody gets things like this. And you start to see these things. Believe me, it gets better and better. But I've lived this way for many years. And if you really believe God, there is nothing. Now you're going to have to work hard. And we work hard in the ministry. We do what the Lord's called us to do. I stay busy. I'm constantly focused on the kingdom. But I don't have a job, so to speak. You know, I don't have a salary. And I just trust the Lord. And we've never gone without. And we never do go without. God's supernatural. We look at our financial reports and the things that I send back to the to my home office and I don't even know how our bills get paid. It's not possible. I make, you know, in money that is donated to us, we'll get from the U.S. as missionaries, it's maybe a fifth of what we need to exist here. Supernaturally, the Lord just, people just pay our bills and do things. I mean, we live, we're crazy. We're just crazy people living in a crazy world where fish have coins in their mouths and birds come to our house with meat in their beaks and people give me chocolate bars and many other things. And this is all part of the covenant we have. We can just rest in that when our life is oriented to the promises of God. And that's the blessings on you and your family and your home. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Why don't we stand on our feet? We're going to pray. This is the word the Lord gave me to share, and I pray that it means something to you, that you can use the information. I encourage you also, when you read the scriptures on a daily basis, that you keep, keep a notebook handy so that you can write down the revelations that the Lord has given you. Those are the three stages, you know, we, we, we first we quantify the revelations because there's elements of it, and then we we stratify them, we write them down and make them plain, and we qualify them. This is where we just write the notes under there. This is what it means. Take a scripture, break it down. You see me doing it all the time. That's all these powerpoints are. Is the scriptures broken down, and I take segments of those passages and explain them. You can do that in your daily Bible reading. You'll be surprised at the promises and how they become real to you when you do that. Father, we thank you this night for your presence here with us. We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you for your word being alive to us. Lord, we are grateful that we have been given the opportunity to be members of this covenant with you. And so we enjoy all the rights and the privileges and the benefits of entering into that kind of a relationship with you. And we say thank you for the blood of Jesus and thank you for the sacrifice that was made so that we could be just like Abraham, that we could go through all these same things, that we would see you appear to us and that you would speak to us as you did to him. You would change us, change our identity and change our name and our, and our orientation from having been one that trusted the world and all the things of this world to those that only trust his holy word. Lord, let us change our allegiance and be sold out for you to be completely convinced by you. This year, help us to grow 
in these realms of faith. Help us to go beyond where we have gone before, reach new heights, go to deeper depths, have our knowledge and understanding become wider than it has been before. Lord, the scope of our comprehension of the covenant, let it increase this year. Bless us, Lord, with your word. As we read it, let it be fascinating to us. Even the portions of it that people will say are boring, Lord, let them become just the most fascinating thing we've ever read. Jesus, be with us. Let the sweet syrup of your anointing continue to pour over us, ministering joy to us, ministering peace to us, joy unspeakable and full of glory, peace that passes all understanding, that stands as sentinel over us and keeps us safe. These are all the benefits of the covenant. And we thank you for it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, give us the things like you did for Abraham or pour blessings into our laps. Your word says if, if we give, if we are cheerful in what we do and we sow seeds that you watch and that, that God is, is not going to be mocked and, and we should not be deceived. But whatever we sow, we're going to reap. Lord, and we have sown and we have paid a price and we are paying a price, but we know that a harvest is coming. Abraham first had to believe to get to this point. He had to believe and trust the Lord and even leave his home and leave his possessions and leave his father's house and his country and go on for him to get to this level and to this place. And he did that. Jesus, do the same for us as we believe you prosper us, bless us.